Hi there, thanks so much for joining us in this webinar where we will be speaking about the three spaces that we can utilize during lockdown for ministry. We don't know how long lockdown will continue in South Africa, our context, or whatever your context is where you are watching from. And more than that, even if we are allowed to gather again, we're not sure if we will be forced back into lockdown. Anything can happen. And therefore, I think the three spaces that we can utilize as ministry platforms are really important to get a grip on. That's what we are going to be speaking on. And right up next, we'll be talking about the first space, telecommunications. Hi, when I do recordings for our church broadcasting messages, our daily devotions and that kind of things, most of the time I just use my iPhone and most of my personnel use their smartphones available at their home. Sometimes we use cameras. I, however, use a very sophisticated piece of equipment to, to hold my cell phone, a cell phone bracket, and it's called the inside of a toilet roll. As you can see, it is expertly cut like this by the expert in knife work, which would be me. Most of the subtitles and the editing you see on this video, well, not most, all of it, has been done by me using free apps and free software that's freely available to everybody. Uh, you say, well, you know something about tech. It is not true. I know very little about tech. In fact, when it comes to most technologies, I'm a very, very, very late adopter. Some of you have much better equipment, and if you do have it, use it. I do have ex access to better equipment downstairs in our church where I'm shooting this. We have very sophisticated cameras. We have very sophisticated programs for editing, and I have a great team that know a lot more than me. I did this how I did this. So that even if you are not one of those people who are privileged to have all these personnel and options available, all the equipment available, and even if you think you're not good at technology and don't know how all of this works, I did it like I did it just to encourage you to just dive in there and get this going. Here's a mantra for you. Fail often, fail fast, and fail forward. As long as you start to try and fail forward, the moment you start trying, you're going to get it right. I'm not saying it's not going to be difficult. I'm not saying you won't be frustrated sometimes, but you get it right and it will pick up speed. So that's just an encouragement and that's just a pre-note because in this session, we'll be talking about the first of the three spaces that we can use when we minister to people during lockdown situations where we are not able to gather. And the first one we're going to be talking about in this session is the telecommunications space. So when I say telecommunications, I'm speaking about phoning or WhatsApp or, you know, any message sing platform where it's person to person, Zoom meetings, FaceTime, whatever, SMS even. The fact is it's a opportunity to talk to somebody or few people face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice or at least text-to-text, -text, it's a personal connection. In the next session, when Tashes will be joining us and we'll be talking about our, our digital space or our virtual space and the common feeds in the social networks that we have, we'll, we'll talk about that. But in this session, it's all about the person-to-person -person connection. Now, we might want to start with why. Why the telecommunication space? Because the moment the lockdown started, the first space everybody ran to, I noticed, was the broadcasting space. So why the telecommunication space? And 
And maybe let me answer that by asking a question of my own. When the lockdowns started, what did we lose? Well, we lost physical presence. And since we lost physical presence, it is possible that we have lost a lot of the personal connection. And we will lose a lot of personal connection if we don't mitigate that somehow or another. So it's really important physical connection. It's important spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. I recently read an article by the World Health Organization and they speak about the, the, the fear of a massive increase in psychological conditions. They are bracing themselves for a great influx of mental illnesses because of the worldwide lockdown and the psychological effects it has on people. Now, before we dive into some technical things, and, and I really don't want to talk about the technical aspects so much because I'm not the guru. I'll point you in the right directions, though. But I want to talk about this as a ministry platform from a ministry perspective. And therefore, I, I, I do not feel bad to speak to you about theology because you're a bunch of pastors probably watching this. So talking about theology is not bad. So let's look at a theology for connection, personal connection during lockdown. Romans 16, verse 16, we read, it's the Apostle Paul writing and he says, Greet each other with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send their greetings. Now, just before you grab the closest person, give them a sloppy kiss. Like most of you know, these kisses were culturally bound. It's like the Mediterranean stall and Middle East stall where people will mwah, mwah, mwah each other on the cheek. Now, don't do that either. See the principle here. The principle here is coming close. He's not writing this to family members. He's writing this to church members. And actually, this phrase, greet each other with a holy kiss, appears three times in the New Testament, near the end of three of Paul's letters to churches. That, that shows how Christian fellowship is something that should happen up close and personal. personal yeah. It's intimate friendship, not just friendship. Christian relationships were never meant to be administered at arm's length. Christian relationships have to be something intimate. We have to enter each other's space. The vision Jesus has for his church is that, that of a close church, real, touchable, true relationships that are. So we have to be more vested in one another than just a hi and a bye or just a like on a Facebook or a fist bump on, on a WhatsApp. We have to really have connection. And you know this because you know your theology. But here's my question. Has the truth of this theology, the truth of this need for connection, changed because we are in lockdown? Or is it the opposite, that now more than ever, this is a necessity? So you and I have to connect with people meaningfully, even in lockdown. We have to find a way, even more so because of lockdown, to have a personal connection, not just a broadcasting connection, but a personal connection with people. It has to be part of your planning it has to be part of your diary. In fact, it has to take up a huge space in your diary, connecting with people in a very personal way. Now, I'm not talking about, when I say connecting, forwarding an inspirational quote to somebody, but a personal connection. In 3 John, we see that the Apostle John, most probably on the island of Patmos, and he is writing to his friend Gaius. So he's in lockdown. And uh, that's why I say theology of lockdown, connection in the lockdown. So he's in lockdown, he's writing to his friend Gaius, and, and he ends his letter like this in 3 John 1 verse 15. Peace to you, the friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Did you catch that? Greet the friends there by name. It's a personal connection. What will make you feel 
that your pastor, if you were a congregation member, your pastor loves you more. In fact, what makes you feel like your team leader loves you more? What makes you feel that anybody loves you more? When you receive a message, did it, did it, you check it, what's up, and there's a picture. It's a picture of a ni nice sunset. And there's some inspirational quote from Mark Twain or Nelson Mandela or Desmond Tutu or maybe even a scripture. Um, the Lord, the, or maybe something like the, the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's a good one. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Or, or, did he? What's up? Just a message. Hey, John, I was thinking about you. Just checking in to hear how you are. Is there something I could possibly pray for? What will make you feel loved more? Now, I'm not saying that those inspirational things don't have a place and they can mean something for somebody. But what will make you feel loved more? What will establish personal connection more? A message that's sent out to everybody on somebody's broadcast list or somebody that thought about you, wrote your name there, and connected with you. Better yet, a call. Hey, John, was thinking about you. How are you doing today? Something I could pray for. We have to find ways to connect with our people in a personal way, not just spamming them with a lot of great stuff. So now I can just imagine and hear your objections. You say, oh, how can I phone everybody? It takes so much time. Well, what do you want to do? Because we're in lockdown. But I don't expect anything from you, dear friend. As a matter of fact, I don't know what your people expect of you. I don't know your congregation. I don't know what they are and how they are and how they think of you and what your relationship is. But I do know this. When all of this is over, you still want relationship with your team. You still want relationship with your volunteers. You still want relationship with your congregants. You want relationship. I've seen phoning people during this time. There is a huge return on investment. I know it's time consuming, but there's a huge return on investment when you are phoned and you phone these people. One of the people I spoke to said to me, Pastor, you made my week. And then he said, no, not my week, my next two, two weeks, just because of a call. He's not somebody that's involved. So he's really on the periphery, but he comes to our church and that connection and they, 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 appreciate it so much so let's go back to the question i asked in the beginning during the lockdown what did we lose we lost some connection we did not lose teaching everybody are going online there are myriads of people out there teaching their hearts out chances are better than you i know for a fact many of them a lot better than me they are teaching their hearts out, but you've got one thing with your people that they don't have, and that is a relationship. That is the one thing. So if you want to work something during this lockdown time, don't worry so much. Worry about it, but not so much about just getting the message out there. Make sure you work the relationships you have. Get connection out there because that's going to make the difference. Now you say, but we're in lockdown. It's not the same having a, a Zoom cell group or, or SMSing somebody or WhatsApping somebody. It's just not the same. FaceTime's not the same. I know it's not the same. Listen, I'm with you on that. I, I, this, this is difficult for me. I know it's not the same. But again, our Apostle John, 3 John 1, 13 to 14, and he writes, he says, I have much to write to you. But I do not want to do it with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. Can I give you my translation of that? John is saying uh, to Gaius, listen, there's a lot I want to talk to you about, but I don't want to do it during this lockdown. Uh, I don't want to do it over WhatsApp. When this is over, we'll speak face to face. John is admitting he He's not liking this. He's not liking utilizing the technology of his time writing because he wants to be there in person. He understands it's not the same. He knows it's not the same. But here's the thing. He's working with what he's got. Even if it's not the same, he's acknowledging, I want to see you. 
but he's working with what he's got. And I want to encourage you, even if it's not the same, work with what you've got. Utilize the technology that you have at your disposal, the technology of our time. Use the telecommunication and work with what you've got. It has to be a big part of your diary and, and your to-do list has got to include some personal connection time. Now, here's the thing. Your people don't just need connection with you, whether it be your congregants, your team, whoever, your elders. They need connection with each other. Just like you and I need connection with people. They need connection with each other. So, so as leaders, you and I have to find ways not just to connect, but to stimulate the interaction and the connection in our churches during this time on a smaller scale. So be innovative. I'll give you some tips, but I don't have all the answers. God's got the answers. He'll help you. But be innovative. You want people to connect. So how can you help your people to connect? Here's some tips that I figured out, and maybe you thought about them too. Maybe you think about some, some new ones. Please share those. But, but you've got to give these people a theology of connection during lockdown. Actually, what you've got to do is just what I did with you is say, listen, you've got to give them a theological framework so they understand we're still busy with scripture. We're still busy with theology. We're still busy with serving Christ. You've got to say, listen, um, this theology of connection hasn't changed because of lockdown. So, so, so arm them with an understanding, a theological understanding. You can use your broadcasting in that. When we get to that space, use your broadcasting space, but teach them the theology of connection, even during lockdown, and then train them in the basics. As I'm doing now, some people will need to, to, to help you, need to help them negotiate certain platforms, maybe in a technical way, maybe in a, teach them in the do's and don'ts of that platform, the social do's and don'ts. And ministry in this instance might really be much more helping people practically than giving a long sermon. Just helping them how to connect with each other. And then lastly, this tip, map out a strategy. You are the leader. So tell your people, this is how we're going to connect in this church. This is how we're going to go. Get, get advice and get your team to give input. Get your church to give input. But the point is, map out a strategy. Your people are looking at you, waiting for you to say, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. So do that. You obviously want to use, when we look at WhatsApp, and, and, and which is a, a big platform that most of us are using, uh, any, any messaging platform, but specifically something like WhatsApp, when, when you can have broadcast lists. But again, when your aim is connection, a broadcast list is close to futile. Nobody f experiences connection. In When you receive something, and you know, I, I don't... I don't even open the stuff. There are stuff that broadcasting lists are good for, inspirational quotes and so on. And if you want to communicate what's going to happen, yes, broadcast list. But for connection, for connection, um, you know what? It can be spam. You can feel like you are spammed with everything you get. So use smaller groups for that. Use small groups for connection. You might want to consider using different groups with different purposes for this connection, that, that is good. Um, also, it's a balancing act. Um, nobody wants to be on 700 groups. So, again, may God help you with the wisdom there. But don't spam people. Use smaller groups for connection and, and invite them to engage in smaller messaging groups. Now, there's a few pitfalls in the setup. It's not the same. We, we have to learn to negotiate this. There's some social rules and, and, and. And one of the greatest pitfalls, there's a lot of room, especially in your written communication, on your messaging platforms. There's a lot of room when you don't hear tone of voice, when you don't see somebody, somebody in a physical form. There's a lot of room for miscommunication and misunderstanding, especially. So communicate this to your people. Tell them, hey, there's a lot of room for misunderstanding. 
You don't hear tone of voice. You don't see body language. So you can easily misinterpret what somebody said there. And you're like, hmm, what's her problem? Tell them. Just give each other the benefit of the doubt. If you really suspect something is wrong, um, just up the communication, if at all possible, to a higher level, to audio or to visual, if you can, to sort out that. But written platforms are the worst for sorting out conflict. You don't want to do that. So you've got to teach your people these basic things of engaging these platforms, not getting in a situation where it's breaking connection because of the misunderstandings. And then very important, and I'll end with this, the rules of engagement, your ground rules, your ground rules. When you create a broadcast list or a group or anything like that, or any meeting in a Zoom meeting, just like other meetings, some of these things are just understood and unspoken, but that can bite you. When you create a group, tell people, these are the ground rules. As a matter of fact, get them to come together and agree on the ground rules. Agree on the way this meeting on FaceTime is going to be run. Agree on the time. Agree on what will be posted, what will not be posted. What will we share, what will we not share? What will we, do we want to know about the guy's work? Well, if it's about connection in a small little group, yes, probably we want to know about what's happening at each other's work and kids and stuff because it's all about relationship. Um, but, but, but put the ground rules in place. You don't want to see 300 pictures of somebody's grandkids. I mean, share a picture of your grandkids, but not every picture you get every day. So put some ground rules in because if you don't, people will start to exit that group faster than rats abandoning a sinking ship. You want the people to stay connected. It's not easy to get people to stay connected. Easy to get them connected, but easy for them to disconnect. You'll just say leave group, leave group. So ground rules are really important. And then in a loving way, enforce the ground rules. Just, hey, remember, we don't want um, 20 songs here. Don't share songs. That's just an, an idea. But share this and this. Remember not to share songs if you said no songs. Just get some ground rules. I hope that helps. Telecommunication might not be what you want, but it's your friend for connection. So work with what you've got. So welcome, Dashes. It's really a privilege having you with us. Uh, we'll be talking about um, the virtual space or the online space that I call it the digital space that we are using as a media platform or as a ministry platform, uh, literally our podiums now. So, so we really privileged to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Baron. It's a privilege. Hello, everyone. So, Tashi, so tell us, why would we want to consider using social media as a ministry platform during this time and perhaps beyond? Um, I think, first of all, it's a platform of influence and communication. Now, in any organization or an individual's life, communication is key and consistent communication even more important. And then I say, thirdly, the, the, the way we communicate and the type of communications and you know, communicating our why, because uh, organizations like churches or businesses, uh, we have a why, we have an agenda, we have a message. And, um, well, at this stage, the average person um, spends about 144 minutes a day on social media oh. or digital platforms. So it is key for us as um, businesses or entrepreneurs and uh, NGOs or churches to um, demand uh, space and time within that 144 minutes to influence. All right, so 
I think what happened to, to us, for example, is, is when we started utilizing the space, you see, you get a lot of views and you get all excited, but there are some shortcomings on these platforms. Perhaps you can just share with us some of the shortcomings that we've got to be mindful of in use, utilizing them. Um, I think the shortcomings, uh, first of all, is to make the mistake to think one platform is enough. Uh, unfortunately, now I'll, I'll tell a little secret here. I'm not the biggest digital fan. I love the offline physical world more, but I've realized, you know, you, now that we have to use online and digital media and, and, and social media, we have to be very strategic. Otherwise, it's gonna, gonna rule your life. So you have to make sure um, who's your target audience. So in this case, let's say you have a church where you wanna reach more than one generation, then you'll definitely have to use more than one platform. And then within each platform, there's different protocol or formats that you have to use from design to video, font size, font types, uh, colors, um, which is very important. So I'll, I always suggest um, using a multiple approach integration process. So integrating, for instance, using WhatsApp to put your uh, YouTube links and your watch, watch, uh, WhatsApp um, well, your YouTube and your Instagram and Facebook links on WhatsApp, sending that to your congregation to remind them. So you're integrating, you're using a digital platform, WhatsApp, to remind your congregation about your YouTube and Facebook and Instagram posts that you just made. So that's important, uh, but not just using it for one purpose, for multiple purpose. And then the next thing is very important is to look at the analytics, the insights or data, mm. which is very important. So the data is like, um, if you can imagine a little picture where there's a lot of blocks, uh, very scrambled. Um, and then the next moment you have to analyze that data. So that's putting those little blocks in colors and stories and patterns. So once you get the data, you, you, read, you read the data, you analyze the data. So the data tells you stories. And then after the story, you have to make a decision. Once you have analyzed the data on multiple platforms and then seeing what story it gives you, then you make certain decisions. A practical example um, is we saw that our, our congregation, the, they peak six o'clock in the morning. Most of them are on Facebook and on Instagram. So when we schedule posts, we will schedule very important posts not after seven or eight in the mornings, we'll do it before because we know the majority of, so that data tells us a story. A uh, one of the other data points that just came in from a different forum that I'm on, a lot of the uh, digital platforms worked in lockdown but the, for, for teens, but the moment the teens started school online, uh, they were not that reachable or in, you know, they, we couldn't reach them on the other platforms on Zoom and WhatsApp. And suddenly you can see the teens are tired of screens. So we had to start using proxies. You know, you have to get someone in the house that's online and work through that person as a proxy to reach the youth. Um, so you have to analyze those, that data literally weekly. And that data will tell a story to make decisions on which platform to use how and the frequency. All right, so, so you, 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 you speak to us about the data, it makes a lot of sense, but for some people watching this, it may be entirely new. Just very practically, where would you find data like that that would tell you these the stories on which you base your decisions? So every um, admin, uh, if, you, if you open your YouTube channel and if you open your um, an Facebook analytics, there's multiple... Um, layers of you know which, which genders are, uh, are you reaching uh, age groups generations uh, the, the types of devices that they use the, the, how long the engagement is on each and every platform um, so every admin person that's got access that opened the Facebook or the YouTube channel or Instagram will have access to that data so you can just practically go into insights every platform's got its own little 
wording. So it's either insights, analytics, or data. You just press on that, and then this whole new world opens up. And the idea is to have more than one person looking at that data, maybe your senior pastor with the worship leader, um, so that they can analyze that data. Because if you're just looking at Facebook data, you might think your reach is incredible. But the reality is most of that reach is very, very um, shallow. It's like three seconds. They just scroll through the feed and then it counts as a reach, which is not very um, reliable data. So you have to look at YouTube as well. So, so in, a, in an earlier conversation you and I had, you, you mentioned to me something about rather grow your, your feed and your online following organically. Don't you just want to make a comment about that? Say again? Uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in an earlier conversation we had, you, you, you and I spoke and you said rather grow your, your online following in an organic way. Um, I think people try boosting so, all of this. Maybe you want to make a comment regarding that. Yes. So um, it's like church. Um, when you have a physical church, you know, you, there's a certain uh, message and culture and agenda that you people you want to reach. So, for instance, um, I'm involved in an Afrikaans church, in Afrikaans community. So we, we're reaching out to the Afrikaans people in our community. So... If we start um, doing paid reaches and you, you can actually curate the people you want to reach in your boost posts and so on, um, it doesn't help if we get, and I, I love I have Chinese friends, but if we get a million Chinese people on our Facebook uh, post now um, and just put Afrikaans posts out, that's not going to be an organic growth, uh, you know, and it's not going to mm -hmm. be very relevant. So the data coming in from our million Chinese friends. Uh, it's not going to be very accurate. Um, so you have to make sure that you, you target and invite and grow that page or YouTube channel with the people you want to reach um, to, to have your message be relevant to them. So, uh, and, and that works through networking and asking people to join, sending invites through and so forth. But your content also helps. So people will... Uh, associate and feel uh, drawn to your type of content. So that's another way. So if you have consistent content, uh, it will also reach people that uh, an organic way. So before you go to paid posts and boosting um, certain things, we will boost like a little 10 or 20 second ad, we will boost, uh, but we won't necessarily just boost messages or services or certain type of ministries. You spoke about using multiple platforms um, uh, and, and also what, what, who you are trying to target with those platforms. Interesting, in our church, we have a multicultural church, but not just a multicultural church, also a church that, that has a whole spectrum from, from people that are quite poor to people that are pretty wealthy. And um, we found that not everybody can, in our context, uh, contingency can 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 talk talk to, talk to us via data. They don't all have data. Some of them um, don't even have access to smartphones. So, what we tried was using multiple layers, determining how much data you can have because videos take more data. For 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 people with less data, we went to getting the word out. We've we've got something like daily devotions, and we we make a. A, a, a picture, literally a picture that we can send out on WhatsApp with with a, with with a devotion on, and then we have use SoundCloud for people that just want an audio option, and then we even went further down to people that don't have smartphones and have no data at all. We send them a very shortened version of the devotion uh, via SMS. Um, perhaps you can just say what, what sound options are there if people are thinking in terms of audio and not just video to reach people that have less access to data than, than many of the other people. Do you have any um, strategy regarding that? Um, yes, we, we have a philosophy or a mantra when it comes to our, um, our strategy. Uh, the one is we call it an O2O strategy so it's online to offline so i still believe that offline the physical 
uh, world is much more important and relevant than the online world. But the online world's here to stay. So you have to have a dual approach. So we'll say it's not either or, it's both and more. So just to give you a practical, exa a practical example, we, um, we, we, send, we have SoundCloud as well, but we also compress the sound bite of some of the sermons on WhatsApp, so we can send it on WhatsApp. But we also have memory sticks that people can pick up. Uh, so I, I, yesterday I went to drop off a memory stick at a, a certain place where people can have uh, to pick up the memory stick. So there, there are some of our seniors, uh, our 60 plus people in our congregation, you know, they don't have access to SoundCloud and WhatsApp necessarily, but they, can, they know how to work with, with uh, memory sticks. So that's our offline approach. So there's a a relationship between the online and offline and strategically making that accessible to multiple people and generations. Again, it is integrating the online and offline. Within the online, it is integrating the multiple platforms and see how we can also take that same principle to the offline approach. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, people are talking about, you know, going live on YouTube going live on, on, on Facebook and then other people are talking about doing a premium. Don't you just want to share something about that? Uh, if what's the difference and what's, what, what, what's not really a difference? Okay. Live is live. So once the red live button flickers on the screen, that means it is live. So what you see is what's really happening in the context of where they're recording. Uh, if you have the, the gear, uh, the streaming devices, the infrastructure to do that, and your musicians and your, the person communicating is well articulated, um, then I think it's brilliant if you can do it. It saves a lot of post-production work, and it's, it's fast and easy, and it's very authentic. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of churches and organizations that has the right infrastructure first, because the audio, audio is first priority if if people cannot hear they get frustrated i'll rather have something with better audio and less video quality than vice versa so if and, and those that uh, infrastructure is not that you know it's, it's not that cheap and it's expensive to get the, the right audio levels and the mix ready especially if you have one more than one musician playing and two or three vocals you know, it's a nightmare to mix that with the right levels uh, into a live stream. So you, have, you need certain infrastructure and preamps and all kinds of things. So when you have one preacher preaching, and that's easier. So that's one audio. But again, the audio needs to be correct. So by the premiere, when you premiere something, and we usually do premiere on YouTube and Facebook simultaneously, we'll preload, we'll pre-record. We'll edit and make sure the levels, the audio levels are right. And then the color grading. The color grading is also important visually. So if you don't do white balance when you record, then in post, if you want to edit, say the person's face is a little bit too red or too yellow, you can fix it easy in post in, in editing so that the skin tones are natural because um, it looks funny, you know. Uh, you're competing with a lot of other ministry out there and it's not a competition, but the reality is when someone goes through a feed and they see a preacher with a red face or a blue face and a preacher with a normal looking face, they'll rather stick with where they can see clearly and listen clearly. Hmm. So we, we, we edit and then we load it up to Facebook and then you schedule it as a premiere on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, then you know the quality is right. There's, um, you know the message has been curated. Uh, sometimes people will, will, you know, if you don't trust, <laughs> some people will say funny stuff on when they. Once the camera starts rolling, it's there's a psychological thing that happens, and that's why I said, you know, if you want to go live, just make sure that people are familiar with the situation and context. Otherwise, premiering it's easier. Um, it, the quality control is in place and the stress is less and the infrastructure, you don't have need that expensive infrastructure. 
we in the, in the previous session I, I speak about uh, and I promise that we'll talk a little bit about how do you engage with the with the live comments on platforms like Facebook and YouTube when you do premiere or go live have you got any tips regarding that um, so one thing you should be aware of um, is not trying to divert them away from what's happening on the screen so some ministries have all kinds of links but it, it takes the traffic away from what's happening on screen so you uh, what one church that did, did they they use emojis so when someone uh, posts certain emojis they start interacting but we have uh, we have live admins that can interact with people if there are any needs or um, people that needs prayer or so on but see if you can do most of that on the platform that you're at. So we've got a different admin for YouTube than Facebook and they work apart from one another. And from there, they will guide people maybe to a WhatsApp number that's more private and personal. But be aware that you don't divert traffic away from what's happening on screen immediately. Um, that defeats the object of the exercise. So, what are some of the common mistakes pastors specifically make make when they when they engage ministry on social and media platforms? I mean, you just mentioned one diverting traffic. That's a big one, but maybe yes. some something else. Um, I think we'll have to split it. You know, there's technical things. Um, and then there's um, some psychological things and uh, communication things. So it's technically, I just mentioned, you know, video and audio. I'll maybe just add a third thing is get a team. Uh, you, you don't have to do everything yourself. I think a lot of pastors try to do everything. Go ask a, a few techies in your church to help. There's a lot of people in your church that's usually up to date with what's happening. They're probably using Zoom with a company or Facebook. So the pastor don't have to feel they have to do it alone. So that's one of the mistakes I've seen. The pastor tries to, to cowboy a shotgun alone, you know. Um, mm. So get a team, a little team that can help you. And be open for criticism. Um, the, and then the angle of the camera, don't put it under your nose. Just tr try to get it at eye level. Uh, most of them put it under their nose. And, and then they don't frame it right. Uh, that's some of the technical things. Or they'll be busy they'll start recording and they're still busy talking to their wife behind the camera or making coffee, unless that's the vibe you want to go for. Um, Cause you know, you only have so much time to speak to people psychologically. I think one of the mistakes, uh, some of the uh, pastors and so on make is they assume that they are just talking to their own congregation. You are on a digital platform that's connected to the whole world. So the first mistake they make is they don't give context of who they are, where they are, and what they're about. And that doesn't have to be long. So now the pendulum, the other extremists, they give too much context and they spend too much time on who they are, where they are, and what they're about. So you have to get a, a balance. You know, five to 10 seconds, I'm Werner, the Baron Day, I'm in Kimberley. Hey, thank you for tuning in. Um, just, just, you know, contextualize and be friendly about it. Um, so that's, that's one of the communication mistakes I've seen a lot uh, pastors do. And then there's no coherent flow in the communication. So we, we use a model uh, designed by a guy called Robert McGee. He worked with Hollywood screenwriters. It's called a hook, hold and payoff. So it's a, a three act structure. It's, you've got the beginning, the middle and the end. So the beginning is you hook the person. So you say, hello, um, boy kisses girl is the end you know the, the start is boy meets girl but the middle the hook is a uh, girl doesn't like the boy that much so there's a little bit of confrontation and so on so it's a the basics of storytelling so if you use those basics of storytelling and pixar uses it hollywood all kinds of uh, you know star wars it's just helping you in communicating your message within a certain amount of time to a crowd that needs that symmetry and structure to hear your message. So I'll definitely recommend and suggest just do some basics on communication science as well. Um, something I found is, is, is it helps you to think 
where you want to to major um what audience you are majoring for like what we did was we we said that when we do our our sunday uh, message we're going to frame it in a lot more um for everybody out there when we do our daily devotionals it's going to be framed a lot more for for our own congregation so so because our daily devotionals are much more focused on not so much in sharing them around getting as many people as possible to watch them but much more actually using personal examples personal people that kind of stuff and it's also much more relaxed mode while our sunday thing we give a little bit more context because we 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 encourage our people to actually share these um so so that's something we found helps us a bit in our thinking so we i agree with you fully we give the context but also helping us think who are we speaking to primarily now which is really really a, a communication technique we use in real life as well you think in terms of the audience sitting in front of you and I, I think people forget when they go online that that's a basic principle we still have to follow thinking who's your audience that you're going to be speaking to right now and i think you make a good point about the whole world can watch it so you've got to keep that at the back of your mind i also think you if you encourage people to share they that becomes really important because everybody likes to say share 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 um but sometimes like with our with our daily devotions we don't encourage the sharing because we actually it is actually for our people we we yes. there's something that says this is td church but that's all of the context is going to get if some bloke accidentally stumbles upon it while on our sunday we say now share this and then we say precisely where we are and where we're coming from so this is something we found helpful no i agree the vernacular and the context um, and the mannerisms it's just being aware of that uh, just being aware of it that already is a good start um, i just want to add to it, when you ask the mistakes the biggest mistake i've seen is pastors not trying just at least try and engage yeah. with online so you know I, i'm just sometimes very cautious that you know we talk about all these things and, and it sounds very overwhelming and i can imagine someone that hasn't engaged with this or start it, it might feel oh, I'm not even going to start. And, and that's the biggest mistake is mm. it's not just at least try and let someone help you when you try. Yes, I, I found um, in terms of the encouragement, I found that looking at the various views when everybody went online, I mean, some ministries has been online for long, but when the lockdown came, well, I say everybody, but many people went online, many people yes. went virtual. And it was new and it was exciting and everybody was viewing everybody. Um, and then it kind of, you know, it, it, it came down a bit. The, the, the newness it was flattened. Gone. It flattened the curve. Yeah, but I found that relationship, actual real life relationship counts for a lot. And it wasn't just the best productions and the best preachers that, that's getting the views. Small churches, pastors that have relationship with their people, their people are actually opting to still engage them, even if it's not the best, even if it's not the best, best uh, production, because they have the relationship with them. They, I found that they will, they will watch the better guys additionally. Um, so, so I just want to say that in terms of encouraging people like you just did, just get, just get there. Your people want you, they know you, they they will actually engage with you if you just try and get out there if you haven't done so already so that's his last question from my side um any last tips um if, if for people who want to try these platforms or maybe any last tips and maybe just some resources that you can point us to that that you know how to's or online going online made easy or, or whatever you know just just to help people that's okay i'm going to give this a try or i'm going to up my game a bit um, what would you suggest? If, if I can, uh, I, I, I get this question a lot. If, if I have to choose only three platforms, because we use about nine or 10 platforms, but if I have to choose three, I'll use WhatsApp, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, and I'll integrate that three. Um, I'll stay away from paid posts for now, 
And I'll just try to get my congregation, like you said, your, the, the people you have relationship with. And then your, your consistency, you know, you know, have some kind of rhythm. People like having a rhythm. Um, mm. Don't be too, spur, you know, maybe on a Monday and then a month later and so on. You know, get, get some kind of rhythm. Like you have Sunday church is, you know, it's a certain time. You know, people get used to that. So that's, that will be one of my, my tips. And then think through your content um, before you put it online. You know, um, if it's something you believe in, don't just put something on to put something on. Moving away from the rhythm because you have to put now, but now you have to think through that, you know. And then themes. If you work in themes, people are more drawn. We've seen it in our analytics. The moment we start using themes, um, people connect to that theme. They want a, a series, you know, they want to start and end the series. Um, and then you have multiple tools. We have like little PDFs that goes with the sermons. There's little prayers. There's, uh, you know, the teens thinking how they can, can use it. Uh, be, be creative. Um, don't spend too, mu too much money. Most of these platforms are for free. And if you don't have Photoshop and all these high-end design programs, which we use, but you can use PowerPoint and Keynote on Apple, which is a free option on Apple. You can really do some really cool designs in that and export that to a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG, uh, whatever the case may be. So start with what you have. Don't try to, and, and my mantra on that is finished is better than perfect and mm. work from there. Well, Tashis, we, we really appreciate you, your input. Thank you so much. Um, it's and a I, I, pleasure and a privilege. I'll be encouraged. And uh, I'll, I'll just throw your number up here. No, I won't do it. But maybe if, if, if people want um, to connect with you in some way, um, is there any way I can point them to, to a website or something like that? Uh, well, I'm on Facebook, so you can just uh, Facebook Tarsis Nivert, and then you can just send me a DM uh, on the Messenger. Uh, I'm, I'm open on Messenger, so anyone can send me a message, and I'll just reply on the Facebook message. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Werner. Have an awesome day. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, people. When we spoke about the telecommunication space in the first session, we asked the question, what have we lost? In this session, where we are speaking about the spiritual space, I want to ask the reverse question. What have we gained with the lockdown? Of course, the answer is time. We, we've been given a, a gift of time. Perhaps more so in the first five weeks, when we, in, we were in forced lockdown, many of us couldn't move anywhere and we had a lot more time with our families and we had a lot more time to engage with other activities. But even now, we have more time. Many of you may already say that's not true. It feels like I'm running around, I'm editing, I'm trying to figure out the electronics, I'm trying to figure out the various platforms, I have my hands in my hair. So maybe you already don't sense that you have time anymore, maybe that's already taken up. The reason is not because we have not been given the gift of time. The reason is because many of us, like people who are in debt, just have a default. Many people, when they're on debt and you, and you help them out of that debt by some blessing, very soon they just revert back to that. It's because they never learn to, to take, get a grip on, on how they manage themselves and their finances. So their default is reverting back to debt. It's the same with us many times. We default in terms of busyness. We default in terms of frantic activity. So even when something as massive as the lockdown happens, COVID-19 the world over, the moment we have the opportunity, we default back to that concept of being constantly busy. Now, when we have time, 
we can engage the, the spiritual component of our lives much better than when we don't. When we have all these activities, the schedule going on, that, that part of our lives, engaging in the spiritual, comes under pressure and, and it's under a lot of constraint. I realized that engaging with the spiritual uh, as a platform, as a space, should really not be something that we we just engage now in COVID-19 time. It's relevant for all times, all phases of our lives, whether we're, we are in ministry or not, more so when we are in ministry. But I believe many of us have been tied up in the activity of ministry so much that we don't always engage that space as well as we should. And now, through... No doing of ourselves through a, a, a literally worldwide phenomenon. We've been given the opportunity. We've been pulled forcibly out of our schedules. We've been pulled forcibly out of the activities that, that literally we looked at and thought we can't stop this. We can't stop doing this. And we just had to. The, the tyranny of that was broken. And we've been given the opportunity to, to repopulate our calendars, repopulate our schedules every day with something new, with new things, with new rhythms. And I hope we, we, we understand that populating it with engaging with the spiritual as a space is extremely important. And whether this is for now in the lockdown and beyond, that should be something that really finds its way into the fabric of our, our daily ministry. I think the good example is set by the apostles themselves in Acts chapter 6 when they refused to be bogged down by purely organizational and operational aspects of the ministry. And we read how they appointed deacons to do that so that they could preach, but importantly, and pray and pray so they could engage the spiritual aspect so we will be talking about engaging this the spiritual space as ministry and then just mention something about the spiritual space as minister which we need to to engage now here's a fact you can pray for your congregation you can pray for your leader you can pray for your team you can pray for anybody you can pray here's the question though do you, do you pray for your congregation or your team or whoever? And I don't want to engage a, a, a lot of intelligent pastors on, on, on the theology of prayer, on the necessity of prayer so much. But I want to ask some questions though. Um, if you, do you believe it will, it will make a difference if you pray for the people we are talking about? Do you believe it will make a difference? Here's another question. Do you believe if you pray for these people, it will make a difference if you pray in a focused, disciplined, intentional way versus the arbitrary, kind of ad hoc, on the go kind of prayer, general prayer? Do you believe that will make a difference? Now, I will leave you to, to answer that for yourselves. But if you said yes to these questions then by all means listen on i know i say yes to these questions so i believe it's relevant for me prayer is a ministry space prayer is not just a place where we are filled again to minister which is very important but it is a ministry space it's a space where the hard work of ministry can happen often we think of the spiritual space is just a space where we go to so that we can minister. But it is in itself a ministry space. And we get this amazing example from this guy called Epaphras, which Paul writes about in Colossians 4 verse 12. And it says Epaphras da -da -da, is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. So let's talk about, because we see this example, we see this Epaphras doing the hard work of ministry for this church of Colossians. Now, 
let's focus a bit on and talk a bit about the, what should the focus of our prayer ministry be so that it yields the greatest results, the greatest return on investment for our intercession. Now, I think the default when this COVID-19 started, our default was um, praying for everybody to be safe, praying for their health. That's what people ask, just pray for us to be safe. And I hope you did it. And we pray for everybody to be safe. We also pray for the circumstances. I mean, many people were impacted in various ways, some very negatively, financially, uh, psychologically, relationally, etc. And so we're praying for people, we, but usually we pray for the circumstances to change. We pray things like, Lord, protect so-and-so, bless them, Lord, and some version of, please change the following in terms of what's happening around them and what's happening to them. And I think, should we pray for that? Could we pray for that? Of course. We have a loving Father. We can ask whatever we want. And I think, and that's my opinion, we should pray for these things. But I want to throw a challenge at you. If you've not done so already, don't you want to go make a study of the things that the apostles specifically mention they pray for for their churches? Remember, the apostles prayed for people that were many times in, in difficult situations. They prayed for people who were often in persecution, people who lived in uncertain times, people who were mocked sometimes because of their faith, people that had internal struggles, external struggles, all kinds of difficult positions. And they pray for these churches. Even if we look at the, the example of Jesus, what he prayed for his disciples near the end. And, and he knows, he knows the hardships they are going to face. And, and we look at what they pray for. Now, how many times, here's the question, go make a list. How many times do they pray for the circumstances of the people to be changed? I'm just going to come right out and let the cat out of the hat. It is a short list. It's not long. How many times, however, do they pray that God would form character in their people, that God will build their faith, that God will help them to be mature, that God will strengthen them to go through the circumstances, that God will help them to, to remain faithful, to bear fruit, to walk with God in their circumstances, to be fruitful in the circumstances, and you guessed it. That is a long list. When they pray these kind of things, I want to give you some examples. Jesus in John 17 verse 14, just before his crucifixion, the high priestly prayer. And he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Here's the Apostle Paul. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 11 to 12. We constantly pray for you. So here's that example again, doing the hard work of ministry, praying for the people. We constantly pray for you. That God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so the name of the Lord may be glorified in you. We saw what Epaphras was praying, that you may stand firm firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. Moses prayed such a wonderful prayer for the people, and, and he actually prayed it for himself, but I think this is a good prayer. We can pray for our people, and he says, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. So what have you been praying for your people during this COVID-19 season? What was the content of what you were praying? So, so we, we asked this question, are you praying? Are you doing the hard work of praying, ministry? Secondly, what have you been praying? And thirdly, who are you be praying for? So that's a question. Obviously, I think we should pray for the ones God has entrusted to us, the people under our care, whether that be a, a small group, whether that be our families, whether that be our congregations or our teams, perhaps even our leaders, we have to pray for them.
But I want to ask another question. Who do you want to reach? If you want to reach a suburb, a city, whatever you want to reach, well, you might want to do the hard work of ministry for praying for that. Just last week, I was walking around and doing what I'm preaching now. So I was praying and asking and praying for the congregation. I was really praying for them. And I was thinking about the city and started praying in tongues. So when I pray in tongues, obviously, your mind is um, fruitful. You're praying with the Spirit. So my mind was wondering, thinking what we should do in the city. And then, and, and the next moment, it's just like God stopped me and says, you want to reach the city? Well, then you better start praying for the city. And I realized, well, I have to pray for the city. If we want the gospel of the kingdom to advance in a city, you and I will have to pray for the leaders of that city. We'll have to pray for the people of that city. We'll have to pray for the other churches of that city. We'll have to pray and do the hard work of ministry for that. We have to pray led by the Spirit. And when you and I pray led by the Spirit, the Spirit will bring the people to our mind who we have to pray for. Now, interesting, when we pray for them, that will help us when we engage the telecommunication space that we spoke on first. Because remember, that's high intensity. That takes a lot of effort. You can only reach so many people effectively one-on-one. -on -one. But if we are praying and doing the hard work of the ministry led by the Spirit, God can quicken in us and Show us who's the right people to connect with at the right time when we do use the telecommunication method. So let's talk about that's prayer as, as a ministry platform. But let's talk about you and me, the ministers of, of, of the ministry. The ministry of prayer and the minister. We've been given time. We've been given time to pray. Are we praying? Are we using that time? Or are we just filling up our schedules again with lots of ranting activity, lots of broadcasting, because we need to get the message out. Lots of that stuff. Remember, now that we have time to pray, and when we pray, it will affect us. I learned a very interesting thing from my cousin, who's a farmer near Swazereneke in the northwest province, South Africa. And... And, and he, he's farming with maize and sunflower and that kind of stuff. And, but but it's, it's not irrigated. So he's, he's completely at the mercy of the weather and the rain. It's, it's dry land farming. And I remember my father used to farm on the same farm when I was little. And they, they have a saying that you can plant until a day before Christmas. And I always thought it had to do with the rains. That you're going to run into some kind of drought because it's a summer rainfall area and we're going to run into drought and, and you have to plant before Christmas. And then my, I spoke to my cousin and he said, no, that's not because of the rain. It's because of the sun. He said, your, your plant needs a certain amount of light units to grow optimally before the cold sets in and it begins to dry out. Because if it doesn't have enough light units just like it needs water units rain units to make it grow it does not produce the fruit it should there's no kernels on the cob so you can be in a situation where there's enough the, the atmosphere is fine there's enough uh, uh, water around the rains are good you have high plants they look impressive but when you open it up there's very few kernels on the cob when they start to dry for harvesting and it's a poor harvest because they did not have enough light units. Oh, I just like this metaphor so much, talking about engaging the spiritual space because everything of this plant was on earth. It's the rain and the clouds and the ground and the everything. But the one thing from outside of that system is the sun and the light units that it produces. And that's why I think it's such a powerful metaphor for us as ministers engaging in the spiritual as a space of ministry. Because we can have everything in place in our system. We can broadcast, we can have the best sound, we can have the best uh, visual editing, the best equipment, best message, we can have it all. But if we don't have something from outside of our system, the light units from God, 
we're not going to have enough kernels on the cob. We're not going to have enough fruit when it's time for harvest. Our ministries may look impressive, but the fruitfulness of those ministries will be in jeopardy because there was not enough light units. So I want to encourage you today. I just get a big sense in my spirit that God wants to use this season where he has given us or we've been given. I don't know what your theology is on that. How much God is in this and how much God is not in this whole COVID-19 thing. But I do know that the Bible teaches us God works everything for the good of those who love him. And he, he is giving us this opportunity in this time to engage with him. To recalibrate. To engage the spiritual space as a large part of our ministry space and i just believe in this season it's a seeding season where god wants to establish something in our spirits god wants to seed something in our hearts and that will produce fruit when the time comes in harvest season it will produce new things it will produce the crop and i think unfortunately many ministers are going to be running around trying to get everything right trying to even make everything seem right, but lacking, lacking in fruit when it's time for harvest. Now, this is true of all times in all ministry, but we've been given, and that's why I speak on this, we've been given a reset opportunity to reset our rhythms. And if the spiritual place is not a significant space into which and from which you minister, I really want to encourage you, use this reset button to make it part of your new ministry, your new rhythm, you, your new normal. So dear friend, dear colleague, use this opportunity. Use the spiritual space. Let it be a significant part of your strategy. I want to end with this. Be very intentional when you pray. Pray. Be intentional when you pray. Pray focused when you enter that space. Pray intentionally for the right people. Be led by the Holy Spirit when you pray for these people. And make sure, make sure by engaging the spiritual space that there will be enough kernels on your cob when the time comes. Thank you so much for joining in this webinar. And if you need to get hold of me, by any means, please use the channels that will follow right after this. God bless you.